We have a request from Councilman Lansman's office to have Dan Rosenthal, who's a good guy to know, who is his administrative assistant. Uh, Dan is here. He's been very helpful to us. If you need anything done in Queens, he's the guy to talk to. He will talk to anybody, including Letitia James. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he wants to say a few words to us. I'm just going to stand here. You can call him, right? My name is Dan Rosenthal. I'm from Council Member Lansman's office. He's actually planning on trying to stop by, but he had to pick up his daughter from school. So. Uh, we're just really happy to have co sponsor this event. We hope you all enjoy. And if you, anyone needs anything from our office, you can always feel free to call us. And that's it. Thank you so much. Quickly to the point. Okay. We're going to talk, to, uh, get, talk tonight about weight loss. Uh, again, as usual, if you have any questions, please reserve them for the end. Write them down on paper and give them to me, and I will screen them and present them. It works out better that way. Uh, with a crowd like this, maybe we'll be able to open them up anyway. I'm going to start off by introducing Izzo Zwirin to speak about dietary methods to weight loss. Izzo is a health coach. He is getting a uh, master's in public health. He's going to be into the health care business. He grew up in the shul. And uh, he's going to talk about dietary methods of getting your weight down and keeping it down. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> Bright. Um, that's right. I just want to be clear about something. A lot of people approached me in the hall asking me if I was a nutritionist or a dietitian. I am neither of those things. I am a health coach with Take Shape for Life. And I just want to be clear that I, I'm, going, I'm in school for a Master's of Public Health in Healthcare Administration and in Community Health. Uh, but I am not a dietitian and I am not a nutritionist, just to be clear right off the bat. I had a professor a few semesters ago that gave me a quote from one of his semesters, from one of his professors when he was in school, uh, George Albee, who's a professor right now in the University of Vermont. I shouldn't say right now, he used to be a professor in the University of Vermont, he is no longer. Um, no mass affliction facing humankind has ever been cured by one-on-one -on -one intervention. Obesity is one of these mass afflictions that we're facing today. And I am very appreciative towards Eitz Chaim and Dr. Bright uh, for, uh, for organizing these types of awareness seminars that we can discuss these matters in not a one-on-one -on -one intervention uh, method, but rather in a community setting where a lot of people can get educated at one point. A lot of you may know me from the past, a lot of you might not, and may be thinking, well, it might be easy for this guy. He was thin his whole life. He, uh, I, I know since he was a kid, his whole family is, is kind of thin. Uh, it's easy for somebody like that to maintain their weight. Uh, what you may not know is that this is not exactly true. I have my before and after pictures from 2013 and 2014, and that is what I looked like about a year ago. And that is closer to what I look like today. And it's by following simple steps, simple methods of not only eating, but regular day-to-day -day living uh, th uh, ideas that you need to take into uh, to account when going through your daily routine. And that's what we're going to be going through here tonight. Um, there are some dietary ideas. There are some healthy living habits. But what I would like to call them uh, are, uh, we'll, go, we'll go through the 10 habits of health. What is a habit? A habit, according to dictionary.com, they had a lot of definitions, but this is the one that suited what this talk was about tonight. A habit is an acquired behavior or pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. What we want to focus on are these concepts that you're going to be hopefully adding to your daily routine and focusing on them and keeping at them until they become an actual habit, something you may not even have to think about something that you go through your day, and this is obviously what I do. I wake up, I go to the bathroom, I eat. These are habits, or sometimes required. But what we're going through in this case is making these uh, habits that we're going to be going through tonight part of your daily routine. How would you change your habit? Changing habits is one of the hardest things for somebody to be able to do. Let's talk about a habit on uh, what, what actually is. Stimulus action. So... If, while you're watching TV, you get hungry, and when you get hungry, you eat a bowl of chips, then what could happen, turn into a habit, watching TV, eat a bowl of chips. All right? Now, not all habits are bad, but we're going to focus on some of the bad ones now, because that's what we like to do here. Uh, we're watching TV, we're eating a bowl of chips. The idea would be, 
maybe to change that type of a thing would be don't have a well, don't have chips available in your house. Don't don't go automatically to the chips. Go to the fresh fruit. Right? Seasons seasons errands. I don't want to. I apologize to errands. Errands did a great job of providing fruit for the first tonight. Um, that there would be a great idea of, of where to go. How would you how would you decide? what that thing is that you're going to be going to. And that's what we're going to be talking about now, changing your habits uh, to where they are better suited for you. Now, I'd like to tell you, to scare you, that if you go home tonight and you eat a very unhealthy meal, that is going to be the thing that really does you in. But that's just not true. All right? One, healthy, one unhealthy meal is not going to be the end all of everything. It's a <coughs> compounding of multiple, multiple decisions that you make throughout the course of your day, your week, your month, your year, your life, that leads you to be either in better shape or in worse shape. So you'll see in this diagram, we have, we start out, most of us generally, generally, start out in non-sick and, non, and, and, and general, general health. But as we make healthier choices over time, our health improves. As we make poorer choices over time, our health uh, decreases. So what we want to be able to do is create an environment for ourselves that we produce more and more positive choices, and in the end, we'll be in a better state of health than the alternative. Now here are, in a nutshell, the habits of health. I have them printed up on paper that I can give you at the end of this, um, just to take home, and you can have them. The 10 habits of health, and we'll go through each one individually. You can look them up on, on here. Now, now, these are fairly <coughs> basic ideas of what's going on. When we get to each one, we're going to be spending a little bit of time going through what each one means. These are just going to be a reminder as to what the habits of health are. The first one is breakfast. Really, really is the most important meal of the day. Um, never skip it. Really don't skip it. I used to, I used to uh, have a habit on, on Shabbos that I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't eat anything until after davening. I changed. I don't eat my 300 calorie breakfast anymore on Shabbos, but I do have a, a little bit of something to eat um, either before I go to shul or maybe I'll step out after Shabbos before leaning and I'll have a little bit of something there. Consult your Orthodox, your local Orthodox rabbi. You can ask him whatever you want to do. Um, but there are, certain, there are certain things that you really just don't want to skip. A, bre a healthy breakfast before an hour after you wake up is a great way to start the day. So, you wake up at 6 o'clock, by 7 o'clock you should have to get 300 calories into your body. Now, what type of food are we talking about? I put on, on, on here the four pictures of generally accepted breakfast foods. We have cereal, we have coffee, we have fruits and bagels. But what type of food should you be eating in the morning? I spoke to my personal physician, Dr. Uh, Bloom, who uh, practices on Jewel Avenue. Some of you may know, may know who he is. And I spoke to him about breakfast cereals. And if you think of maybe the, the classic healthy breakfast cereal, you might think of Cheerios, if you want to go a little bit more modern, maybe uh, Kashi or, or Wheaties, very healthy ones. Now let's think about the least healthy cereals, like Cocoa Pebbles or, or uh, Fruity Pebbles, very unhealthy cereals. However, according to what I've been looking at, the nutritional value of the two of them actually isn't that far apart. Really, that's not what you should be focusing on. The big thing you should be focusing on is serving sizes, right? The serving sizes are listed on the side of, the, you know, of every item that you buy, hopefully. <sighs> serving sizes are very important when it comes to cereal, because when you pour yourself a bowl of cereal, you're pouring yourself a bowl. Does anybody want to take a guess as to what the serving size of a of cereal is? Three quarters of a cup to a cup, depending on the cereal. But you should be reading the side of the thing to tell you what the actual serving size. The average bowl in the American household probably holds between uh, two and two and a half cups of cereal. So, those of you who may pour yourself a bowl of cereal are having two, two and a half times the amount of cereal you should be having. Those of you who go back for a second bowl of cereal, who knows what you're putting into your body, plus if you like to drink the milk like I do, then you have a whole new set of problems. Uh, let's move on to bagels. Great, you're, you're, at, you're at some sort of, you're, you're, Sunday morning you went to go get bagels. You went to a bris to have bagels. Bagels, again, not a terrible thing if you're going to do it once in, a, once, uh, once in a while. 
However, it shouldn't be your daily breakfast. You should be focusing against the cereal. The exception is if you have a heavy workout that you need the carbs. I happen to do a heavy workout in the morning. I need the carbs. Sometimes I'll have a bagel afterwards. But you should be really avoiding having a bagel every day. Once in a while, every two weeks or so, if you want to pop a bagel in, that's fine. Coffee. Again, everything in moderation. You need, you, you need your cup of coffee to get you going in the morning? That's fine. But don't have six, seven cups of coffee uh, in the morning to get you going. Same thing with fruits. Fruits, you all, everybody thinks, great source of energy, great source of, 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 of natural sugars, but one apple does the trick. One banana does the trick. You don't need to have a banana, an apple, and an orange in the morning. Exercise. I just spoke a little bit about exercise. Now there are, <coughs> obviously, we all know that there are uh, a tremendous amount of benefits to exercise. I have them listed on the on the board before, behind me. I'm sure if you think long and hard about it, you can think of more benefits. There are a lot of benefits to exercise. However, not all of us have time to exercise every day. Not all of us have the strength to do a workout. Not all of us have the money to, to afford to go to a gym. There's a lot of barriers that, go to, that, that, that are involved in exercise. So what can we do to maximize our time, maximize our energy output, and find ways during the course of the day to add in some more exercise? So I have here what's called non-exercise activity thermogenesis, calorie burning, what we call it the NEAT system. And these are making slight changes to the movements you make on a regular day. So for instance, obvious one, everybody knows this one, take the stairs instead of the elevator. You work in an office building, take the stairs. Not all of us work in an office building, not all of us live in an apartment building, some of us have stairs anyway. We take the stairs. Parking further away than you would normally do to take more steps. I work in Williamsburg, Brooklyn where it is impossible to park close to where you need to go. So my steps are a lot. However, if you work at a place with a parking lot, maybe try parking a little bit further away once in a while, or every day. Walk the long way home from shul. Um, for those of you who have multiple ways to get home from shul, in this neighborhood you definitely do, take the long way home from shul on a, on a Shabbos, on a regular day. Don't drive to shul, walk to shul. And do more, uh, do more chores in the old-fashioned way instead of relying on modern conveniences. Now, I'm not telling you to take your laundry and hand wash it, all right? There are limits to this. That's a little bit, that's a little bit out of the problem. If you have time to hand wash your clothes, then you have time to do <coughs> your full exercise. What I'm talking about is if you have, let's say, a Swiffer, uh, a Swiffer wet jet. It's really convenient. You just put it, push, the, uh, push the button, the water comes out, you mop around. All right, there's that. But what happens if you, instead of doing that, you take an old-fashioned mop. You wring out the mop. You're doing the heavy lifting with the mop. That is exercise. It's not taking you much extra time throughout the course of the day. These are things that you can do to maximize your energy without giving up your time, without giving up your money, without giving up, uh, without, without completely destroying your body without, that you would do possibly with a full exercise. However, there, are, there is, of course, the EAT system, which is exercise activity thermogenesis, which is the, the uh, joining the gym, getting a, an exercise video, something like that. So if you get to the point where you feel more comfortable advancing uh, ahead, there are videos out there, less advanced, more advanced videos that help you out. Join a gym, they have beginner's classes. Uh, go on a jog. Go on a jog throughout any, any, way you want, any way you want to go. Just go on a walk. I had, I had one client that I spoke to a while ago that their exercise was that they would go on a 25 minute walk every day. That was a nice little addition. So what did they do? They lived in this neighborhood, actually, and they, instead of taking the bus to the subway to get to work, they walked to the subway to get to work. That was the 25 minutes. Obviously, once it got to winter, it got a little bit more tricky, but that's what they did. They took the, they, instead of taking the bus, waiting, waiting outside for the bus, they walked to the subway. Now we move on to the daily meals, the things that you're going to be going through every day. I cannot stress the importance of planning your meals ahead of time. We, I spoke to you about breakfast earlier, about eating within the hour, an hour of the day, the first hour of, of, of when you wake up. But it's so important to plan your meals, not just because it's a money saver. I, I, got, I get to work, forgot to bring lunch, I'm gonna go down and I'll buy a salad, I'll be good today, I'll buy a salad. Right? That's not what I'm talking about. You wanna plan your meals. The night, before the, the, the night before, sit down, get a pen and paper out. What am I gonna to have tomorrow? And I'm going to talk about when you should be eating in a minute. But let's, let's talk about what I'm going to have. I'm going to write down this is what I'm going to have for breakfast, this is what I'm going to have for lunch, this is what I'm going to have for dinner, this is what I'm going to have for snacks. 
plan it out, get it in front of you, stick to that plan, all right? And we'll talk about exactly what you should be putting into your meals, calorie count, etc. You're going to be eating smaller, more frequent meals. We're generally told uh, three squares a day. That's kind of gone by the wayside. We're not talking about three squares, and, uh, three squares a day. We're talking about eating every two and a half to three hours smaller meals. So, if you're up for, let's say, uh, you sleep for seven, eight hours a day, we'll talk about that also when we get to sleep. Uh, you're up for the other, uh, the other 16 hours a day. So you're talking about six meals, give or take, a day. You stay up away a little longer, maybe a seventh meal, you go to sleep a little earlier, your fifth, only five meals, but you're talking about eating every two and a half to three hours. Those of you who are doing the math in your head, maybe I'm wrong about that with the hours, but I'm right about that with the amount of time in between meals. So here's a sample of what you should be doing. Now I have my calories, uh, calorie count for weight loss versus my calorie count for maintaining your weight. Now, <coughs> a disclaimer on the calorie count for maintaining your weight. If you have a job that requires strenuous activity, if you work out, you're going to need more calories. But I'm talking about for a general, uh, a general frame of reference. It's different if you're a male, if you're a female. Age plays into it a lot, but I'm not going to get so far into it. This is a general understanding of what, of what you're looking at. You're looking at a 17 to 2, 1,700 to 2,000 calorie a day plan. And you have your, your time frame. I told you every two and a half to three hours, so you're three hours, three hours, three hours, three hours, two and a half hours to three hours, depending on when you go to bed, depending on when you wake <coughs> up. Sample meal. All right, if anybody, I'll, I'll pause here if in case anybody wants to write this type of a thing down. But this is what we're really looking at in terms of a healthy daily routine. And this is what we want to get across. It's a healthy daily routine that becomes habit. So the night before, you're going to plan your meal. The next day, you're going to stick to that plan of the meal, okay? If anybody wants me to stay in here a little longer, just raise your hand. Okay. What's 300 calories? <laughs> I don't know anything that's 300 calories. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, no, it's serious. It's um, well, 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 if, you have, if you have a question, just wait. No, no, no. <laughs> I, said, I said it kind of snarkily, but it, it was, oh, I said it's kind of snarkily. What's something that you could have for 300 calories? <laughs> no, the, I, I, was, I was kind of joking, but I was semi-serious also. All right. Well, most things, most things, like, oh, 500 calories. Uh, well, that's a full serving. What if you'd have a serving of it? Then it's 250 calories. I mean, you drink, you drink like a soda, it's like well, 150. Well, yeah, yeah, that's 150 calories. We'll, 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 talk, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that when we get to water. <laughs> All right. All right, so we have our glucose insulin response curve. And those of you who are familiar with diabetes might be more familiar with this than even I am. However, the idea is that you want to maintain a normal glucose insulin response. Um, these examples that I have on the board, orange juice, bagel, salt, uh, hamburger slash soft drink for lunch, a candy bar in the afternoon, and a huge meal in the Now, I'm not saying that we all go through our days and this is what our, our, our day looks like. By the way, I know some people that, that come to my clinic that this is what their day looks like. But, even if your day looks like only two of these things, bagel in the morning, huge meal in the evening, it, your, your blood glucose is doing this, all right? Especially if you're only doing the three squares a day. If you're doing the three squares a day, then forget the, forget the snack in the afternoon, forget the orange juice in the morning, you're doing one of these, one of these, one of these, and your blood sugar is all out of whack. What you want to do again, going back to those six healthy meals throughout the course of the day, you want to make it more uh, where, your, where your blood glucose level is even throughout the course of the day. Obviously, it's going to jump up and down when you eat stuff. It's always going to happen. However, you do want to keep it to a point where it's generally on the same level. <sighs> Shabbos. All right? How many of you have heard that? How many of you think that honestly is true? <laughs> All right, one of us. You can't gain weight on Shabbos is not true. Sorry. Sorry, Rabbi Yoman. <laughs> it is not true. You can gain weight on Shabbos. That is something to tell us. Uh, to, to make our... You can't gain weight. I just have my Shabbos That's all. <laughs> you can, you can get your... <coughs> right, let's put it this way. Maybe you're not going to gain the weight on Shabbos, but after Shabbos, it's going to come and hit you. All right, the food that you put into your mouth on Shabbos counts the same way it, uh, anything else counts. So my wife and I were talking about starting this Healthy Shabbos initiative. I, it's actually her idea. 
Um, and people are not going to like me for this, and I don't care. Um, how many of you, by a show of hands, if you are davening in a shul of Kiddush, that is the first thing you eat on Shabbos morning? That's, that might be the first thing you eat on Shabbos morning, alright? Uh, that was actually lower than, that was very good, lower than expected, alright? A Kiddush is a bad idea if you don't maintain what you're supposed to be maintaining. If you go to the Kiddush and you have a piece of kogel and you have cholent, and even in this shul where we have mostly uh, parv and milchah cho- and, 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 and milchah Kiddushes, we have cookies and we have soda, and these are the first things you're putting into your body, and then you're going to go home and you're going to have a whole other meal. So you had your, your cholent, and you had your kishka, you had your, and you had your soda, and you had your kogel, and now you're going to go home and a uh, half hour later, you're going to put more food into your body. You're having basically a double lunch with probably very unhealthy foods as your first meal of the day. Want to avoid that. If you go to a kiddush, maybe, uh, maybe some seltzer and, and some herring, sounds about good, and go home, have your meal. But again, as I said before, shouldn't be the first thing you put into your mouth a day. If you, can, if you could have something to eat before you go to shul, that's also, the, that's also a good idea. <coughs> Plated appetizers. One thing that I've noticed, especially about uh, the Kew Gardens Hills community, whenever I go out to somebody else's house for, for lunch on Shabbos or dinner on Shabbos, there's a ton of appetizers. Here's some salads, and here's some dips, and here's some breads, and here's, and here's fish. You have a ton of fish, and you can fill the fish. It's like the hot dog of fish. Um, you have all these appetizers, and slow down. An appetizer is not supposed to be a meal. The appetizer is supposed to be something that whets your appetite for the actual meal. And on Friday night, you have the appetizer, then you have the soup, which is another appetizer, then you have the main course. All right? Slow down. Plated appetizers might be the way to go. It'll save you money. You won't have to be spending all that much money on appetizers. Everybody has a small portion. Here's something to whet your appetite for the rest of the meal. Then you get into your meal. Kugels. For those of you who have been at a meal with multiple kugels, that might not be the best idea either. You're going to have a kugel, have one kugel. All right? A broccoli kugel? It, just because it has the word broccoli in it, doesn't make it any more healthy. It's still a kogel. It still has the it still has the uh, the the carbs that any other kogel has. All right. Uh, mains. I've been to many meals with many different mains. One or two mains should be enough. And then after Shabbos meal, you're gonna go right to sleep. No, that's not a great idea. You just had a lot of calories, a lot of carbs, and then you're gonna go take your nap. How about going to take a walk first? Burn off a little bit of those calories, 20, 25 minute walk, come back, go take your nap. Yeah. Moving on, we have water. We have a tremendous amount of benefits for just plain water. We'll get to soda very shortly, I promise. Uh, flushes toxins, carries many nutrients. You have all these, these positive things, and a lack of water, obviously, we know, leads to dehydration. How much water do we need per day? Now the average men and women, 13 cups and 9 cups. What about the 8 cups? How many of you by show of hands have heard 8 cups of water a day, 64 ounces of water a day, that's what you should be having? Now the reason that we say that is because it's easy to remember. All right. Uh, really, women, 9 cups, men, 13 cups is where you should be at. Uh, 8 cups is a good place to start. All right. If you don't already do the 8 cups, Maybe tell your boss at work you're about to start doing eight cups of water a day. Uh, you might be needing some breaks, but eight cups is where you should be going, especially because the water that we get into our system <coughs> does not only need to be coming from actual water, but the fruits that we, the foods that we eat, um, also has water in it. Not a tremendous amount, but it does have water in it. And between the eight cups that you drink and the food that you eat, you probably are getting close to the thirteen or nine, depending on your on your gender. What about Gatorade? What no, about good. soda? Gatorade, no. I don't want. I don't want to say. <laughs> I don't want to told say me, no, I went to the doctor yesterday. And he told right. me no. I don't want to say. I don't want to say right off the bat. No. What hundred percent is true. Gatorade does not count towards your eight cups of water or your nine or thirteen cups of water. If you need to drink Gatorade or you need to drink Powerade, they make the dietary ones, the zero calorie ones. Powerade has a Powerade zero. I recommend those. They're actually quite good. Vitamin water, another, another po possibility. Anything that says zero calorie on the side is a better option than soda. Is it even a better option than diet soda? Soda is actually good. I, I discovered a good reason for uh, Coke. I actually saw it on, online this week. It is a tremendous, tremendous uh, toilet cleaner. 
pour a little bit of coke in your in your in your in your toilet bowl and it cleans it out. It'll be there for an hour. Um, but you you should be sticking to clear drinks. Water, seltzer, Sprite is not considered clear in this case. Water and seltzer are, are two fairly good ones. You want to add a little lemon to it to make it a little flavor, that's fine as well. Um, however, these are just the average. If you exercise a lot, if you work in a humid environment, if you have illness uh, or health conditions, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, those are all possibilities as to why you should be drinking even more water than the average. Again, consult your physician. He should, he or she should be able to tell you how much water you should be drinking on a day, daily basis. And obviously, these are from the Institute of Medicine and the Mayo Clinic. Moving on, sleep. How much sleep do I need? I'd like to stand here and tell you that there's a magic number for sleep. You, you sir, you need nine hours of sleep a day. But that's not true. There is no magic number for sleep. Different age groups, different individuals, somebody who has more sleep, somebody who has a higher, a higher uh, uh, a, a, a job that requires more exertion might need more sleep. Someone who has a, a fair, like a, a desk job might be less sleep. But according to the Institute of Medicine, uh, sorry, the, uh, the National Sleep Foundation, yes, there's a National Sleep Foundation. Uh, they outlined the difference between the uh, <coughs> of people and what the average amount of, of uh, sleep a person needs. Now, if you look at the last one, adults 18 and plus, I'm looking around, and I think that's everybody here, between seven and nine hours a day. I'm sorry if there's a teenager here that just looks older. Um, but between seven and nine hours a day. Now, what does that mean? Now, here I have my, your basal sleep needs and sleep depth. Your basal sleep needs is what you're going to need there. Your adults, seven to nine hours. However, we have this thing called sleep debt. If you live in New York, everybody, if you live in New York, it's highly possible that the demands of New York take you away from your sleep. I have to get up early. I have to go to my job. I have to get home. I, get, I stay at my job late. I get home. Uh, I, I have this responsibility and, and, and my kids and my family and all of this stuff, and I don't get the other sleep I need. The problem is you build up that sleep debt. And remember that graph I showed you in the beginning with the healthy choices? and the unhealthy choices, remember that? Yeah. Nodding of approval, great. So that's the same type of thing that you get with sleep debt. The more times you, <laughs> it's funny, I'm sorry, you're yawning in the middle, this is a great time to yawn. So, um, the more and more sleep debt you build up, the harder and harder it is to pay it back. Same thing with, I don't know, regular debt. So that's what you have to try to avoid. Try to build up, and unfortunately it doesn't work the same way in reverse. You can't build up more and more sleep and store it for later. That's not how that works. Sleep debt is a one-way street. You can't save up sleep. And the only way to combat it is to get yourself back on that schedule. One of the habits, get more sleep. You're not going to be able to sleep your way back to, to, the, to being in the black in <coughs> sleep. The only way to do it is start from now. If you, if you feel like you need more sleep, start from now. Balance your schedule that you're going to need, that you're going to, need to fit in more sleep into it. Um, we have what causes sleep, depri the sleep deprivation, excess weight, pain or discomfort, allergies are all possibilities. Again, consult your doctor if you have problems with, with getting enough sleep. And you have your symptoms here, loud snoring, trouble breathing. If you, uh, if you live with somebody and you have loud snoring, you know. Um, trouble breathing, rest restless leg, heartburn, bad there's a lot of different things that come from not getting enough sleep. And this is just the tip of the iceberg with not getting enough sleep. There's so much more, couldn't fit it on the slide. There also might be causational factors for not having... Yeah, but I, I, we'll, we'll, st we'll stick to what I have here. There, there, we, we can, I could present an entire session on just sleep. All right, But I, I can't stress enough how important getting enough sleep is. Um, steps to getting to a healthy sleep. You're going to set your bedtime and you're going to set your routine. Same thing, remember, that's the key thing to remember here. Setting a routine, creating the habits for yourself. In the daytime, you're going to get out of bed. You're going to uh, limit caffeine, eat responsibly, say no to naps. Do not nap. It's a bad idea. Uh, exercise regularly. All right? Shabbos is different if you want to nap on one hold it against you. Uh, nighttime, you're going to decrease stimulation. A big thing that I see people doing, that I see people doing, I'm guilty of this myself, I get into bed and before I go to sleep, I'm on my phone. I'm checking Facebook, I'm, I'm, I'm checking my emails, I'm watching a video. It's not a good idea. Do not, limit your stimulation at night 
Um, eliminate your cell phone use, I've just said that. Minimize your liquid intake because you don't want to have to get up in the middle of the night. Um, you're not going to exercise at night. That's why I told you about before I have exercise in the, in the morning. Uh, take your medications. You're going, to be, you're going to be taking your medications. Avoid alcohol and you can resolve your family issues. Sit down with your family. Not if it's a huge fight. That's probably not a good time to do it at nighttime before you go into bed. Any outstanding thing. You want to do a little like straightening up around the house, dishes, that's fine to do at night. <sighs> Number six, support. <clears throat> this uh, support is a, an extremely, extremely important concept to have with you when you're going into any behavioral change. Now, we're talking about behavioral change, we're talking about changing your habits. You need people with you in order uh, to succeed in any sort of behavioral change. 85% of dieters quit or gain it back within the first half a year after they're done dieting. And one of the main reasons is because they don't have anybody there encouraging them. Maybe they had it throughout the diet. Maybe they didn't. They sometimes did it themselves. But they went through the diet, they lost their weight. They went through a formal diet, they lost their weight. They went through whatever they were doing on their own, they lost their weight. Um, but in the end, what, what happens is they gain it back. Why? One of the main root causes is they don't have support. They don't have a team behind them. And what type, of, what type of support are we talking about? We're talking about personal. Personalized support is a key factor. I just said that. All right. We're talking about formal support. What's a formal support? Formal support is a doctor, a dietitian, or a nutritionist, a coach, a trainer. I'm a coach, by the way. Um, these are your informal nutritionists. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures, and I'll, I'll get to informal, informal in a second. Okay. I'm going to show you a picture, and I'm going to, the first picture I'm going to show you by show of hands. Tell me if you recognize who this is. Sorry, I can move out of here. Nobody recognizes who that is. I keep it a little surprised, actually. This is Augustus Gloop from the 1971 movie. What Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Okay. Does anybody want to take a guess at what Augustus Gloom's uh, personal uh, problem was? What was his What was his fault? Ate too much. He ate too much. This is what a fat child looked like in 1971. I'm going to show you now the 2006 remake of the movie and the child who played the same character. Okay. This is the difference of what we're looking at now. So, I mentioned before that people might not have remembered that I was heavier. Okay? And that is because our mentality of what is heavier has changed. This would not have passed for obese today. You want to exaggerate, especially in a movie like this, you would want to exaggerate what it is. This would not have passed. This person could have played Charlie in today's movie. This person is what an obese child looks like to people today. So, if you have friends and family telling you, you don't, you don't have to worry about anything, you, you're fine the way you are, but you feel like you <coughs> want to get healthier, right? You are going to have a tough time succeeding because people aren't going to be on your side. You need people on your side. And that's what we're talking about family and friends. You want to have family and friends on your side if you decide to make these behavioral changes in your life. Without the family and friends, you can get all the formal coaching you want, um, it's going to be extremely difficult to maintain the healthy lifestyle or make any sort of behavioral change. Number seven is quiet time. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you have your good ideas. Uh, beach, book, meditation, crossword, hike. Your, those are your good ideas. The bad ideas are surfing the web, watching a movie. Basically, anything that makes you focus on one specific thing at a time is a good idea. When you're reading, when you're at the beach, when you're <coughs> meditating, you're doing a crossword, you're going on a hike, there's not much in your mind. At the most, you're reading a book and you have to remember what happened. You want to be able to focus on one thing at a time. When you're surfing the internet, when you're watching a TV, there's a lot of different things that are going on in your mind, a lot of stimulation. You want to put aside 15, 20 minutes a day, give yourself some quiet time away from people. I usually do this on my lunch break. I go to my car on my lunch break and I, I sit there and I read. Uh, maybe not so much in the last couple of months when it's been cold, but that's what I like to do. It's really nice to get yourself some quiet time. Keeping a fruit food journal is another important way to, 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 to maintain what you know about yourself. You write down every day what you ate, right? We said about before about planning, right? You could make in your food journal, tomorrow I'm going to eat X, Y, and Z, 
and then you could check off next to it, I ate X, Y, and Z. Oh, but I also had a chocolate bar. Oh, but I also had a celery stick. I, you can add those things in. Over time, you can go back and look through what you, what you put down there, and you can see how your diet can be improved, how it's changed over the last, and it's literally just something that could remind you, and when you see your decisions that you made in front of you, it's a lot easier to, to figure out, oh wow, I need to change. And I put some apps, if you have a smartphone, put some apps there, Google Fit has one. I think the, the Apple, if you have an iPhone, it's called the Health app, I'm not sure, I don't have an iPhone. Um, and my fitness pal is the one that I use. The thing I like about my fitness pal, and I think the other two have it also, you can track your food intake, you can track your exercise, you can just write down, I walked to my car today, and you, I walked, it was about uh, two city blocks, whatever it was. And all those things can be stored in all this information, in all these apps, and you go back to it after a month and you look through, oh, this was a good day, this was a bad day, this was a good day, and you see, start to see yourself getting several days of good in a row. And you can do that with a pad of paper <coughs> and a pen also, um, but I just like this because it's smaller and easier to keep in my pocket since I already do. Sharing, uh, can't believe I'm going to say this, but sharing is caring. The way, the way to get to have that support is by having other people do it as well. Um, how many of you, show of hands, have heard of CrossFit? I didn't think so. CrossFit is an exercise routine that some people do, and I know that everybody who's in CrossFit is trying to get everybody else into CrossFit. And it's not because um, they're telling you that you have to do this for yourself and it's, it's going to be great for you. They're telling you to do that because they want somebody to, to bounce ideas off of. You always want to have um, somebody to bounce ideas off of how to improve um, what you're doing wrong. Um, so when you're sharing what you're doing with others, it adds to what you can achieve. Um, you can, if you do it uh, with family members, you can share those ideas at home. There are online communities of these things. Uh, there are several. You can always just Google it, find out where the online communities are. One that I'm part of is called the Meltdown Challenge. Um, and in which case, there are several things that you do a day. There is a, uh, a group discussion about healthy, healthy tips, what you've been doing that day. Uh, if you slipped up, you can could, you could bounce ideas off of other people. They give you a one, one of these healthy habits to, to focus on every day. There's a lot of different things that go on there to add to somebody's uh, already healthy lifestyle or to get somebody on the track of a healthy lifestyle. And if you're interested in, in the Meltdown Challenge, I could, I could talk to you about it afterwards. Number 10 is literally the most important habit that we have. Now, I didn't mention this at the top, but <coughs> these aren't habits that you should be picking and choosing. I'll, I'll do that, I'll do this, I'll do that, but I'm not going to do that one. All right? You should be doing as many of these habits as possible, because if you notice, I will constantly refer back, a lot of them are intertwined with each other. A lot of them refer back to each other. A lot of them rely on each other. So this one relies basically on all of the habits. This one goes back to every single habit that we had. Okay? You want to be able to monitor yourself. You have your weekly weigh-ins. Weigh yourself if, you, if you're maintaining, if you're, uh, if you're trying to lose weight, weigh yourself weekly. Even if you're not trying to do anything. Weigh yourself weekly. See, well, I gained, how did I gain four pounds this week? I gained three pounds last week. So obviously something you're doing is wrong and you need to adjust it. Okay? So you wanted to give yourself weekly weigh-ins. Uh, the tape measure test is always, uh, always a, 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 a popular one. Uh, consult your journal, right? Referring back to the journal one. And you have your pinch test. Pinch test, but usually you can do it on, on the midsection. So you'll, if, you, if you are in a, uh, a program where you're trying to lose weight, in the beginning, Pinch yourself. See how much. See how see how much belly fat you have. See how much fat you have underneath your arm. And then over the course of time, you'll begin to notice if you stick to the plan that you're on. If you stick to the plan you're on, you'll be able to notice a change. Wow, my fingers are a lot closer than they were last week, or that they were in the beginning. A, a really, really, really strong uh, advice that I would have, and I, I and I didn't do this. If you join a plan, if you Forget it. If, you, if you're in a formal plan like I did, if you're in your own plan that you want to, if a friend tells you about something, take a picture of yourself beforehand. And not every week, but maybe two months, a month and a half down the line, take out that picture, look at what you look like now, compare it to a picture of yourself that day. See what the difference is. I didn't do that. That's why I had to crop that picture in the beginning. I, I should, what I should have done is take a picture of myself, um, maybe wearing some 
more revealing type clothing, and I probably would have put that up here, and it would have been good for me. I would have seen, I would have seen my progression. It would have been a very strong motivator for me. And if you felt comfortable showing people, this is what I used to be, this is what I am now, then it could be a strong motivator for them as well. And I believe that's it. And um, thank you very much.